Hello and welcome to Tokyo Inklings. My name is CY. You can find me on my website at tokyostationpens.com, on Instagram and TikTok at tokyostationpens, and on Twitter at tokyostationmnh. And my name is Jacob. I'm a Fuda fan on Instagram and on Twitter and on TikTok, and have a blog at fudafan.com. All right, this is episode 67. We're, we're slowly crawling up to the three digits, which is. Uh, it's still a few years away based on our release schedule, so I think it's at least two years away, but we're slowly making it up there, you know. I feel like once we got to 50, it was like, okay, you know, we, we, we've we done well, um, but it's still only halfway, right? But now we're almost to like that 75 mark. I feel like, okay, we're we're slowly inching our way up to the three digits, and that, that, that makes me feel good. Yeah, it feels like we were just at 50. Maybe this is me getting older. Thing. Everything happens seems to be happening faster now. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, today we're gonna bring some un- unusual news. I think not everything is gonna be focused uh, on Japan, but um, still, it- it's either relevant to to our market or to our lives. So I think that'll be that'll be really fun. So the first thing that we wanna we wanna touch about is uh, the the closure of LCDC. Um, so they they have a long name. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say it. But um, the reason why I want to talk about this uh, really quickly is that, um, so basically LCDC was, uh, I believe, a Dutch retailer who uh, was known for really, really good prices, but like really terrible customer service and really terrible support and really terrible uh, wait times. So they would sell you stuff they didn't have in stock and then they take like months to get stuff in. And um, Quay actually she she bought she said she bought like some nakayas and she waited like three years and then she had to cancel it with them afterwards so um you know I, i'm not quite sure how they stayed in business so long but i have to say um i was also lured in by their by their good prices because a few weeks ago or maybe some months ago now uh, I, I spoke about this light blue um, Mont Blanc, the Mont Blanc Glacier, and um, I, I saw it in the store, and it was it was fantastic. It was very very beautiful, and very rarely. I mean, I have a large ish Mont Blanc collection, right? I, I think the focus of my pens are, are actually Mont Blanc, but very rarely do I see one that I like in the store nowadays because it's um, you know I've, I've got stuff to say about this company. But when I saw this one. It was, first of all, different color, very unusual, I think, for Mont Blanc, um, outside of their, their, you know, their literature series. So they have the Petit Prince, uh, the Little Prince, and um, and they have, um, I think, uh, 80 Days Around the World right now. It was very unusual for this uh, to be part of the part of the lineup. And I, I really liked the, the nib engraving. And the, the finial was actually the, in the same style as the as the solitaires so the difference with the regular finials is that it's all one part right but the solitaires they have they most of them are, are metal so the finials are half metal and then only the top is plastic and um i i'm building up somewhat of a, a collection of solitaires so i really wanted it but um the japanese prices as usual were were not super favorable at the time and when I saw that they had this, uh, I think it was like a King's Day sale. Um, it was about like 500 euros. Um, I decided, you know what? It's okay if I wait. And if I pay through PayPal, I'll have buyer's protection. So so let's do it. That's what I was going to ask you, because I would assume that even if you pay by a credit card, but if, especially PayPal, that you, you'll you be safe. Yeah, um, I don't have other things to say about my credit card uh, but um anyway so, so i paid through paypal this was back in april and um i emailed them like in may and, and they they did say that if it was out of stock they had to back order it from uh from mont blanc which is fine you know i had time in may i, I sent them a message to say hey uh you know do you have an eta on this and they said you know they're still waiting fine go to the u.s in august to come back and you know, between this, I'm like trying to call them, trying to email them, no response. So about uh, two days before this specific event, I said, you know what, I've had enough. I'm just going to ask for my money back. 
before they announced that they were bankrupt. Yes, yes. So, so like two days before they they announced, I said I'm gonna uh go go and ask for money back. I emailed them, obviously no response. So I, I filed a claim with with PayPal, uh, and PayPal is having me like wait for, I don't know what, but anyways, uh, that's in the works. Um, because I saw that this pen they had a BB on Fontaplumo. And I had some credits from Fontaplumo because I tried to buy a Conid from them. I remember that. Back, yeah, back in <laughs> 2020. So it's been, I, I, I had the worst luck with, uh, with these, these European retailers. Um, and so I had some credit because, uh, because Fontaplumo said, hey, we, we don't know when we're going to get them in. We ordered them, but we heard nothing. So, uh, you know, please wait. I waited two years. I said, you know what? I'm going to use those credits to buy this Mont Blanc. Um, so I did it, and it got here. It's a BB. It's a very, very nice pen. Three days later, uh, LCDC announces that they have filed for bankruptcy. So I'm, I'm glad that I snagged that last BB from, uh, from, uh, from Fontaplumo. Um, it's, it's very beautiful. I have it here. And yeah, that's that's pretty much my latest acquisition, uh, Jacob. Have you got any interesting acquisitions lately? I think you have a a, a funny one, uh, which is from the same brand. <laughs> yeah, I I recently got a Mont Blanc with a signature nib, and uh, I have been testing it basically like a very 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 fancy pilot parallel. <laughs> Well, this is what I actually want to ask you because, from what I recall, you're not the biggest fan of stubs, right? Like you tried various different stubs from from different people. Uh, you prefer more of that, like architect, the Naginata style. But you did tell me offline that you thought this pen was uh, was pretty fun. Yeah, I mean, it it puts down a lot of ink, yeah, to no one's surprise. Uh, so I, I like it for that reason. It I'm still trying to get used to it, as you say. I don't normally use stubs. Uh, my handwriting with this pen doesn't look the nicest, but uh, I'm having a lot of fun with it. <laughs> well, that's good. That's good. Um, and there's another Mont Blanc news that I wanted to cover. We actually talked about this one, I think, last week. This is the Mont Blanc Naruto. And um, we covered it on our last podcast. Uh, the pen addict covered it right after... Uh, and we were sent photos. I'm not going to tell the source, but we were sent photos of this pen, and it looked like a 146. I'm like, oh, well, great. Uh, it's it's very interesting. It has uh, ruthenium trims, except except for the clip and the ring around the section. So it's the, the section ring is is actually orange so there's there are two accents of orange and then they have this naruto um it's the insignia that they have on their their headbands in the anime or in the manga and i was just very curious because i noticed that some people overseas have already bought and and played with the ink um and i was curious if we were going to get it in japan um slash whether they already have it in japan so, and, you know, obviously Naruto is from Japan, so I thought, you know, they should have it, but who knows. So I go to the, the boutique and and I asked them, I said, uh, hey, do you have this pen? And normally the Mont Blanc, um, the, the boutique staff are, are just the worst, right? Normally they're, they're, they're awful. They um, don't answer your questions. They're not knowledgeable about the pens, but this time the person that I spoke to just happened to be the store manager and she was actually super, super helpful, super knowledgeable. So shout out to Kondo-san um, from the Ginza Boutique at Mont Blanc. She told me that uh, not only will Japan get this release, uh, they haven't announced, they haven't made any PR announcements yet. So technically, I don't think these stores in the West were supposed to sell them yet. The announcement will come out on the 11th of October. And the the sales will start on the 12th of October. So are you talking about the ink or the pen now? The entire set. Okay, okay. The entire set. So not only do they have the ink, 
they have the pen, they have belts, they have um, bags. And I thought that this was a surprisingly very complete collection for Mont Blanc. And it's interesting because um, I, I think they don't really do a lot of these. I think the last one they did was um, uh, Spike Lee with, with the purple glasses. The, in, the other interesting thing that I found about this pen is that it's not going to be a 146. It's actually going to be a 149. And I think they don't do a lot with that 149 pen in terms of special editions. So, you know, with the 146, you have the solitaires, you have the duets, you have all, all this you know, stuff. But with the 149s, it's either the super, super high end uh, collection, which is, you know, super out of uh, out of the price range. Or they have the, the standard model. But this one, the price is actually not so far from the standard model. So I, I think I, I will purchase one of these um, just to just to have one. Um, and, and I think it's interesting. They, they've they've done something different with the trims. They've done something with the with the section lip. And it, it's very rare for me. I, I actually have never gone to the Mont Blanc boutique and bought something at the boutique. But um, but yeah, th- th- that was very interesting. And she showed me various uh, signature slash uh, calligraphy nibs as well. So that might be in my future. Oh, well, that will be in my future as well. I would say, I mean, based on the photos, this whole release reminds me a lot about Platinum's Star Wars release in that you have a very interesting and unusual idea and what I would consider to be questionable <laughs> execution. I don't think the pen looks good. And, and I, I would... It would be absolutely hilarious if you see one of those like big Naruto paper figures outside, like a fancy Mont Blanc Main Street store. Oh, yeah, they're going to do the entire display. They told me the entire display is going to change. The inside of the store is going to turn orange for the for the release. And they're, they're going all out on the media, on the PR front uh, for this as well. It's just not announced yet. I just really wonder how they're going to pull that off without being like too... Tacky? Like, Yes, I, I off brand basically for Mont Blanc, right? Because this yeah. is, I mean, how do they make this look classy, high end? Well, I would agree with you that I don't think the pen looks the best, and I think that um, I think that the th- there was some criticism that I read online that it looks like they just slapped, you know, some generic pictures or some generic visuals on on the on the on the leather and, and called it a day uh when i was working back in uh in luxury we i worked with a brand who who collaborated a lot with um with a lot of these cartoon characters uh, we did uh we did um uh, disney we did mickey mouse we did uh we did donald duck we did doraemon especially with doraemon we had a lot of problems because there are a lot of um issues that the the copyright holders the license holders were very strict about and um i I would say it's not always so easy so i'm actually surprised at how extensive uh this collection is what's interesting about the pen and i agree with you it's not the color scheme that i would have necessarily chosen it's engraved on both the body and the cap and i i found that kind of cool um it's not the most attractive pen, but it is uh it is very novelty. And just the fact that they don't do a lot of stuff like this is appealing enough for me to, you know, go and be like, hey, you know what? Let's try this out. So uh that apparently is uh is in my future. Um it, it's not super, super expensive. So, you know, wh- once the announcement comes out I would suggest people to go check that out all right we had some big news shock the fountain pen industry uh last week i believe this was broken by uh musubi uh run by daryl um jacob you you you're the the in-house paper expert what do you think well, so you sent me this link to this blog post, um, I think it was like one week ago, 
Uh, to be honest, I haven't had much time to follow like the social media chatter because I've been just too busy this week. But I read that blog post. There wasn't any like, sources cited. I didn't find any official announcements. So I actually contacted the manufacturer directly to try to confirm this. And uh, Nippon Seishi. Yeah, so I contacted uh, uh, Nippon Paper, Nippon Seishi, as I said, uh, which uh, we talked about them before, but Nippon Paper is Japan's second largest paper conglomerate. They're so, huge. Yeah, they're, they're more than like 10 times the size of Tomogawa and they make all kinds of things. So I didn't, I wasn't too hopeful that they would respond like from like a question from some random uh, podcaster about <laughs> an, an like niche product but they did a, a few days after i sent my question they did respond and they told me two things first of all yes cosmo airlight is being discontinued but also they have a replacement product called b7 natural which mm. is based on B7 Tranex, which we covered a bit more than a year ago, but it's a bit off-white, just like Cosmo Air Light. So that's what I uh, got from them. So do you remember our discussions about uh, B7 Tranex? So, um, you know, let's get the elephant out of the room. I'm not a fan of Cosmo Air Light. I think it's too soft, it's too cushioned. And it makes your lines fatter or wider than they actually should be. Um, there's that kind of spread uh, that, that we talked about. So I wasn't a fan of Cosmo Air Light. However, however, I was a big fan of B7 Tranix. So I'm curious to understand whether B7 Natural, will, which one will it be more like? B7 Tranix or B7 uh, or Cosmo Air Light? Yeah, so I think what we said about the B7 Tranex back then was that, uh, first of all, it's actually white rather than this sort of cream of white that Cosmo Air Light is. And also, it has a bit more of a texture. It feels more like actual paper rather than that kind of plasticky feel that you get with Cosmo Air Light. So we were big fans of a B7 Tranex. Uh, but then if you recall... There was a bit of a problem with B7 Tranex a few months after we discussed about that. And the specific problem was that there were reports about uneven like, quality. There were theories about bad batches. And it turns out that the issue with B7 Tranex was that this paper was and still is manufactured at two different paper mills so nippon paper being this enormous company has like over a dozen different paper mills all over japan b7 tranex is manufactured both at the ishinomaki paper mill up in miyagi and also in the iwakuni paper mill down in yamaguchi and the thing is if you use this paper for its intended purpose which is printing books like all of these papers we will talk about, the Cosmo Air Light, um, B7 Tranex, and also B7 Natural, they're all advertised as being paper for printing, paper for magazines and books and so on. They, Nippon Paper does not advertise these papers as being for handwriting, for planners, right? That's just like a happy accident. And if, as long as you use this B7 Tranex paper for its intended purpose, then the paper behaves identically, or at least that's what Nippon Paper claims, that whether you get the paper from Iwakuni or from Ishinomaki, it behaves the same as long as you use it for its intended purpose, which is printing. So they, they, they don't let you choose like, whether you want to buy paper from a particular paper mill. It's just one SKU, and they have no, they have no intention to change that. And that is why some why you stop seeing this paper being sold by people who, who make notebooks and so on because you could not guarantee that you get the, that you get the quote unquote good B7 Tranex for handwriting so that was the problem with B7 Tranex now unfortunately it i don't know this for sure but based on my research it seems plausible that you may have the same issue with b7 nat natural in that it's actually made at different paper mills and i haven't tried it myself but there's unfortunately a chance that you that the quality will be different depending on 
act where it's manufactured so it is not necessarily going to be a replacement for Cosmo Air Light for um, people who use fountain pens and you know pour inks pour ink on the uh, paper yeah so um given that i'm actually quite curious why they don't make like a sub SKU out of it it seems like it could be an easy easy solution for for B7 Tranix, right like for whatever that's going out for printing you know you, you just use whatever right whichever mill but then for like writing or or planner journal type of customers you only send it out of one mill right i, I don't i don't see that to be such a huge logistical issue since even the mills are in different locations so that's that's a bit weird to me but yeah i yes assume that the kind of sales volumes we're talking about are so insignificant that it's not even worth the effort for them because you don't you don't see a whole lot of b7 tranic even before this problem uh, became known you didn't see a whole lot of b7 tranics um, paper products for for um like for, for handwriting right um so yeah I, I just don't don't think it is worth it and one and one thing to and kind of related to that one thing to understand about these really big paper companies like nippon paper and oj paper is that as a whole they're actually doing pretty well uh the the actually the the paper for printing division of each company doesn't actually doesn't do very well because as we know people buy fewer magazines and so on but what they, where they do see growth and where they do have a, a positive numbers is like cardboard boxes for example you know in this age of you know e-commerce and amazon yeah, yeah. cardboard boxes is a good business and also in japan i mean we have talked about how japan finally realizing that plastic is pretty bad and it's <laughs> increasingly moving away from small plastic wrapping everything into plastic right and that is an opportunity for these paper companies so you know packaging of like milk cartons and and what have you and also you have things like biomass basically like paper residue as as fuel yep. so those are the areas where these companies are actually focusing their efforts because that's where it's growth while this paper for printing is just, you know, a legacy business that I think they just barely keep afloat. Yeah, and um, I actually uh, was kind of semi, I guess, hired to do a market entry business plan for a um, paper bag manufacturing company in Germany. And our conclusion was that, you know, the Japanese local industry was just too strong for them to just set up shop here and, and open a mill um and, and nippon paper was actually one of the big players i mean this is a huge huge company that provides paper-based products for just about every sector that you can imagine right that you can you can think of so you know it, it's not super surprising that the paper for printing is uh is going down that being said um you know, you have these huge paper companies like Nippon Paper, which nobody's heard about. And then you have companies like Kokuyo and, uh, and you know, MD, who are making paper that's specifically for writing, right? And Japan, regardless of how you cut it, it's, it's still a very paper-based society. I think um, in, in schools, at work or whatever, um, you know, I think there's still a strong tradition of handwriting, actually. I think most Japanese people's handwriting in English is, is better than, I would say, probably the average in, in the West, just because they, they handwrite so much. Um, so I, I'm wondering whether it's time, or, or do, you think, do you think it would be a good idea for a company like Nippon Paper to, you know, um, just like Tomoegawa did, release... And sell these uh, these the rights to to this paper, and you know maybe maybe sell it to like a Kokio, maybe sell it to like a Design Fill. What are your thoughts on that? I suspect that the only reason that Tomogawa thought it was worth selling Tomo River was 
was a uh, planet because I think planet is still a big business in Japan. So I think Tomoe River was a bit special in that sense. Having said that, I mean, Nippon paper has all kinds of papers. I- I'm sure it's going to at least some of the the other B7 papers. There's like, like a dozen different B7 papers. At least some of them will hopefully be okay. But also, as you said, I mean, there's there's just so much other paper out there. Kokyo has job and Midori has MD. If you go to like, what is it, like Yamamoto Papers website and you look for like A4 examples, there are like going to be like dozens of different types of paper that you never heard of before. And many of them are surprisingly good. So... The fact that you know Cosmo Air Light goes goes away, it's uh, to be honest, I don't think it's a big deal. Um, I, I'm I'm curious to to know your opinions on this because I think, ironically, the bigger the company is, or or the bigger the company grows, the harder it is to make, um, make products for the analog, right? Like. We see, for example, Pilot, um, long time, has not really put in a lot of concerted effort into, into fountain pens because they've, they've grown to such size that they need to, they need to reach for scale. Um, they need to, to do mass products. Uh, whereas, you know, a company like, um, like a smaller company could focus on the fine writing uh, instruments. I'm curious, uh, do you think that there should be more smaller companies maybe taking on this mantle and removing it from these larger companies? I think there's definitely some truth to the fact that building manufacturing for scale and building manufacturing that is like nimble and can handle various like small lot productions, I think that's a very different type of challenge. And being able to do one doesn't necessarily mean you're able to do the other. If you remember when we talked about Tomogawa before, when we look, looked at their various reports, they talked about how they were looking at making smaller and more cost-effective like paper-making machines. Yeah, the sales volume has to be there to some extent to to justify it. But I think they, there's a possibility that a more m- nimble manufacturer uh, could potentially have machinery that is more suitable for for small lots. Yeah, I mean, just just because uh, Nippon Paper with its giant Ishinomaki paper mill cannot make something uh, small lots doesn't mean that no one else can do it. That's true. Yeah, so so I don't. I I think as long as there is a a need for planners, I think we're gonna still have different papers. And I'm, as you suggested, I'm looking at this Yamamoto paper shop, and I'm seeing this San San Kento, which looks really really interesting. Um. So yeah, I might be in the market to go out and buy some more interesting paper from from Yamamoto, and you know. I I jokingly said on on some pen Discord I said you know hallelujah you know Cosmo Airlight is is discontinued obviously it's sad to see a variety go but I I don't necessarily think that it's um it's the end of the world uh and you know there there are so many other great papers out for people to discover so yeah it it's definitely huge news but it's not the end of the world so I have just just two more things to say about that one is we have been theorizing that Sakai Technical Papers Iroful is actually Cosmo Light. I guess now <laughs> we might see if that is true or not, right? Uh, if they have to make some changes, that, then I guess that, that was a strong sign. The, the last thing is I want to end on a positive note because uh, I recently heard, and unfortunately I can't say much about this yet, but I heard that for fans of Cosmo Air Light is going to be an announcement next year that's going to make people very happy. So unfortunately, I can't say more about that yet. But um, if you like Cosmo Air Light, there, there's light at the end of the tunnel. So yeah, wait until next year and you might hear about it on Toki Inklings first. Yeah, there's Cosmo Air Light at the end of the tunnel. Exactly. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> that's a podcast title right there. <laughs> or, or, or maybe there, there isn't Cosmo Air Light at the end of the tunnel. 
who knows who knows all who right knows? all right um next up we have some japanese pen news and if, if you've listened to the podcast uh for the past couple of years you might have noticed that um we obviously do talk about sailor a lot um but we've kind of slowed down on speaking about every single uh release ever because they just release so so much um but this week and and this is what i really dislike about sailor they release their pens in like the span of three days right and it's it's all the time so it's so hard to keep up but but this week's uh, releases, I think, are actually quite interesting. The first one uh, that was announced is the Sailor Velio, or Velio. Uh, I don't know how to, you know, properly say this made-up word, but uh, it's basically the kind of swirly acrylics that you see a lot in Western custom pens, but they've now, you know, officially done it in... A, a sailor pen so th- this looks like something that somebody would ask sean newton to do when i saw this i thought it was a pen bbs four five six in one of those like translucent swirly acrylics because that that's that's what it looked like mm. it it looks nice but one thing i noticed when i looked at, at the product photos both on instagram and on the website is that most of the photos understandably show the pen without any converter and without any cartridge which makes sense because that that that's when the acrylic looks the best right but that also i think is the whole problem with a translucent cartridge converter pen i mean i like cartridge converter pens i don't like cartridge converter pens in a translucent pen because it just doesn't look that nice well i i don't know if i agree with that because they specifically match the color of the converter and i've just sent you a picture where they have specifically um the converter they they even have a section on the on the news release they say you know with this trans transparent base you can see inside so you know they they've especially um you know come up with this converter that that matches the colors so I don't know. I, I think there's something that you can play with here. And I think the white one looks really good in particular to me. But they did su- they did say something about uh, the inside of, of the barrel. So what they said here is um, regarding the cutting of the acrylic. Uh, so what did they say? Let me see. Yeah. Normally when, when you cut the, the material... You polish the outside until it's like a, basically like a mirror finish, but you can't do the same, or or it's much harder to do the same on the inside. So, to me, what this looks like, uh, what it looks like, um, in the press release here, it says, uh, you can't remove the machining marks inside the the acrylic as well i'm gonna just paste that particular part into our chat the product that they have here uses a special type of blade and uh during during the the finishing process they kind of cut away at the inside as well to make it a a smooth surface but to me what this sounds like is that on the inside this pen might be a little bit matte and then on the outside it's smooth that's that's what i got from uh, from that press release i still think it looks ugly with a video it it would look so much nicer if this was like a piston filler plunger filler inky dome whatever it, it's yeah I, I i'm with you I, I would like to see this in a realo but uh you know it is it is what it is right one sort of tangent about that the problem with the Riello is as far as i know all the Riellos, even the translucent or transparent translucent ones have that ink window because i guess it's the same with the injection molded yep base shape right so i, I want a a proper Riello demonstrator without an ink window because you don't you shouldn't have an ink window on, on a transparent pen okay that that's fair that that's fair criticism um 
I, I can accept that. I, I'll take one of those without an ink window <laughs> too, as long as it's transparent or translucent, right? Um, yeah, but nonetheless, I think this is something that's new for Sailor. They they are being experimental with this, and I appreciate that. Uh, I appreciate that a lot because I think you know whatever you want to say about Sailor. I do think they are really pushing the boundaries um, on a known and, uh, you know, it, it's a model that works well. The ProGear is, is a model that works very, very well, especially for these limited editions. So, you know, I'm glad that they're they're doing new things with that. What was the price again? I think it was somewhere around uh, six, yeah, 60,000 japanese yen for the zoom and the music so oh and these are made to order only so um yeah the, you can you have to go to your your favorite store and, and order these and apparently the name comes from the english word, word veil and then japanese iro <laughs> that's a very japanese <laughs> way of branding things yeah yeah <laughs> yeah so so there's that the second uh, news that I actually think is, is far more interesting is um, we've previously, I think, talked about Sailor building a new factory uh, in Kure. And what they've done is uh, they're going to open this new factory in 2022, so this year, autumn. And the the factory that they used before they used it for over 70 years and inside the the campus you know there, there were trees growing with with the factory and they've cut down um some of these trees and made i believe it's a hundred uh th there's 500 of of one version the darker one and then a hundred of of the lighter one um of these wooden pens that they've taken from the factory and i think this is this is pretty cool it looks like a nagasawa pen yes because this shape is supposed to be custom for nagasawa but i guess you know if you're the manufacturer you can do whatever you like i'm not sure nagasawa is going to be happy about this um did you see the the nib imprint yeah, the Hiroshima Factory 2022. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so this is uh, the same imprint that they had in the older style. Ah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but but this looks like it's laser engraved, right? Yeah, that's an interesting choice. Yeah, th this is a laser engraved version of the older style, um, older style imprint that they had, which I. I don't know about that, um, but you know, given that there's only 600 of these pens, I guess I understand it. Yeah, but we've seen laser, we've seen properly stamped nibs for lots, lot smaller lots than that. By the way, somewhat related to this, did you see that the uh, the main building on this new quote unquote campus is shaped like a nib? I did not. I'll have to look at it. Do you have a link for me? Uh, this is a photo someone sent. Sorry. Yeah. Um, what I think is also interesting is that the the nib, the way that they've described their twenty one carat nib, um, they said that it's a it's a pen or it's a nib that gives good ink flow with a feather touch, and I was like, I, I don't know, like a feather touch is not. Uh, yeah. Uh, now I'm looking at the photo of this uh, of the factory. That that does look pretty <laughs> cool. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty funky, but <laughs> that's that's pretty cool. I, I like it. I like it. Yeah, I think we we need to do a trip to uh, Hiroshima and take a look at this. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. We got to do that. Uh, field trip. Exactly. Yeah, and Hiroshima is a nice city. So, um, I mean, Kure is a bit far out, but Hiroshima itself is, is quite a nice city. So, stay in Hiroshima and go out to Kure. Sounds good to me. All right. 
Um, so those are, are the two Japanese pen news. We've also got some Chinese pen news, Jacob. Um, you're usually more in touch with the Chinese pen news than I am. So why don't I want to hand it off to you? Yeah, the one I want to talk about first is this Moonman C4 that I noticed on uh, FPN. It was it like one or two days ago? And I, I had this idea, I'm not sure if we talked about it, but I had this idea a while back that I wanted to uh, commission a custom pen with the theme Sakai Eske meets Inkunuma. Like, so you had this this like old style like Bane Sakai Eske shape and an Inkidome Japanese style eyedropper, but it was like, but it should be, you know, translucent or maybe sparkly and with some interesting, interesting nib. This pen, Moonman C4, is pretty much what I had in mind. Well, the nib is just like a regular Moonman nib, but who cares? But the rest of the pen is, it looks like a Bane pen with an Inkido, it's an Inki, Japanese style Inkidome eyedropper, but it's translucent. I think it looks great. This pen, I mean, it's, it's beautiful. It's, it's absolutely beautiful. Um, it looks to me like the cap is all one piece. Mm. And and so this is really the way that they used to make pens back in the day. They would they would um fit the clip into the cap through a hole and then they would uh they would secure that with, with a screw. So from the photos it looks like it's it's a singular piece. And um, mm. The clip itself is also very distinctive. It's, I believe, one of the logos of, yeah, it is the logo of, of Moonman, right, with the little M and, and the drop. Yeah, I think so, so. Yeah, I actually, I love this clip. This is a small, very cute clip, and overall, this pen. I mean, this pen looks fantastic, Jacob. This is, this is an incredible, like, if it works, and, and I'm sure it will. Yeah. Yeah, I thought it was a plunger filler at first because it looked like a steel rod, but then I read a description. It's actually a Japanese style Inkidome eyedropper. Are there any other, but assuming it is steel, are there any other like steel Inkidome eyedroppers? I always think of that as being like either like squeaky plastic or like ebonite or something like that. I don't think it makes too much of a difference, especially if it's stainless steel, then you're probably fine. Mm. I mean, that's what the nibs are using, right? So and you're not going to have too much of an issue uh, with that. Yeah, because that's also what what plunger fillers yeah. like Pilot exactly. Custom A23 have, right? So, so yeah, so I, I don't have any any concerns about like stains or such. I'm just wondering, have we seen any Inkidome eyedroppers with like stainless steel? Rod? Maybe, maybe not the original ones, um, but I think it looks good. I think it looks good. There's one criticism I have of this pen. I think the trims should be. Um, should be silver. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I I don't have a strong opinion about that, but I I could go either way. Uh, anyway, I ordered order two, and they I see I got a notification this morning. They have left the Guangzhou and are on their way to Tokyo. So <laughs> looking forward to trying. Them. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You gotta you gotta let me see that for sure next time. Um. But. Yeah, this is this is an incredible pen. I think the only other thing like this on the market is the Opus eighty eight, right? Yeah, exactly. Which is uh, quite a bit more expensive, and and I only tried like one or two Opus pens, but they always have this sort of squeaky plastic sound. But when I when I use the rod, maybe that was because I was using older models. But I wonder how, if if this will be different. No, you're right, and usually you have to you have to grease up the the Opus eighty eights before before you use them. Um, well, when, whenever we talk about Moonman, there's always this element of like you know, copying or you know, because because they do do some models, which one of which we will talk about next. But um, there there's a reputation of of you know copying other pen brands, uh, and this is obviously more reminiscent of you know older Japanese pens that are no longer made. I think the clip is very distinctive. This is not a copy. If this is a copy, then you know, come on, we have a lot of work. <laughs> a lot of worse offenders out there. Yeah, so th that's what I wanted to to ask you because this to me looks looks like you know this can belong to them. You know, it's it's yeah, it's uh, and it, it's it looks like an elongated version of the of the Q three. Exactly. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the next pen I want to talk about is uh is their 136 the moonman 136 uh i i learned this from from our friend sophia but this pen looks like uh it, it looks almost exactly like a mont blanc 146 have you seen this pen yeah i've seen the pen and our friend leo has posted a lot of photos uh, of it it uh, doesn't even come with some kind of like tool to to uh, remove the, remove the nib. Yeah, so I think there's a tool. Um, I don't know if you have to buy it extra or or if it comes with it, but it it removes the nib and the piston, and it works also for the Mont Blanc 146 and by proxy 149 as well. That alone would be a reason to buy it because you can buy these tools to disassemble Mont Blanc, but they are like 5,000 yen or, or more, right? So here you buy, get it <laughs> open. So I'm actually a little bit, uh, I'm I, I'm a little bit miffed about this pen, not because I think you know, they, oh, you know, they're trying to copy Mont Blanc, whatever. I I think the the appeal of the Mont Blanc 146 or or a big appeal of it it is the I think it's two things, right? One is the nib. And second is the snowy cap. You have a pen here that functions and looks almost exactly the same as the 146, but you've lost the two most, you know, distinctive things about that pen, the nib and, and the snowy cap. I'm just wondering if there's not some kind of like lost opportunity here, if they had made this a flat top version instead, more reminiscent of, you know, the actual, um, the actual 136 of you know the 40s i i feel like there there's an opportunity to have made a pen that doesn't look as strong of a cap of a copy um yet maintains all the, all the good things that you're trying to do with this pen this is reminds me of the discussion we had when moonman made that pilot capless mm. look alike that it was like a lost opportunity. Why make just a black and a brown one? I mean, okay, we know you you, you can make something that looks very similar. Why don't you Why don't you use this opportunity to make something that you can't get from Pilot that is like I don't know, a colorful one or whatever. Actually, they did that later on. That they improved on the design. They made a version of that capless look alike without the clip which is actually quite a welcome improvement but they could have done yep. something more interesting with the colors so I, I agree here you know you have you have like a canvas here that you can do something a lot more interesting with yeah so i, I wish that they would um improve on this you know as i said for me if they do a if they do a flat top version this would be a no-brainer flat top longer ink windows this would be a no-brainer nobody else is doing this on the market <laughs> you know you, you, you're it's it's like you know printing money to be honest so hopefully they, they go in some interesting or more interesting direction than that i don't think they're in the vein of like pen bbs where they use a lot of different uh materials but at least they they can experiment with the shape yeah maybe they will do brass version <laughs> see that would be interesting that would that would be interesting yeah um, speaking of Pen BBS, though, there's also a new Pen BBS. Yeah, the four was it four eight nine, which is the touchdown filler, right? Yes. Um, I don't know much about that filling system. I had one of those like, Wall Eversharp pens before, which which has what mm -hmm. I think is a similar filling system. To be honest, I'm not a huge fan of that filling system, but I like the fact that Pen BBS keep experimenting with filling systems. Um, the pen itself looks nice. Uh, would you would you get this pen? Well, I I think this suffers the same problem as uh, what you were talking about with uh, with a sailor. So they've got all these beautiful translucent materials, but the filling mechanism is opaque. Mm, right, right. <laughs> so, um, for me, it's it's a question of well, what. Why did you do that pen in, in these materials then? Because, I mean, while the materials look really nice, they're translucent and the inside is a huge silver thing. Yeah, you don't see the ink, right? You don't see any of the ink. Yeah. And um, it, 
Is it a sack filler? I, I can't tell. Because it looks like it's... It, I think the original touchdowns were um, filled by sack. Um, so, so it was like a pressurized mechanism. Uh, so I think, I think these are sack fillers as well. And that makes it much less appealing to me. Uh, Does that, that limit what kind of inks you can use? I think with modern materials, you're probably okay with, with any kind of inks, to be honest. Okay. Yeah. But I think, you know, for, for design reasons, um, you know, maybe they could have made the, instead of a metal sleeve, maybe they could have made like, a, you know, a plastic sleeve, an acrylic sleeve instead. That would have been interesting because um, then you're actually seeing what's going on. And then I think that would be worth a purchase. But as it stands now, uh, I don't think these are... I, I like that they're innovating. I, I like that they are trying out all these new systems. And, and PenBBS is, uh, I mean, literally it's you know a bulletin board system. So they're really fans of fountain pens that just want to you know do stuff in these crazy small lots. So they're, they're the opposite of uh, Nippon Seishi, right? They're the opposite of... Um, Nippon paper. They they just want to make small lot stuff for for enthusiasts. So it doesn't surprise me that they they did this. Um, this is probably not a super commercial effort for them. Um, but but I, I appreciate what's going on. You're not a big fan of the the name, right? I'm not a big fan of the name, but uh, you know, I'll accept it. And I have to say, the stuff that they're doing with the gold games are are, are crazy. So so I like that. Yeah. All right. Um, so before we close out, uh, I've been experimenting a lot with Twitter. I think you've been experimenting a lot with um, with TikTok recently. Um, and you know, on, on my side, I've noticed that uh, on Instagram, obviously, I'm posting in English. The large majority of my audience, you know, speaks English. So, so that's always been you know the, the medium of communication. But I do significantly poorer on on Twitter, so I decided to switch it up a bit. Uh, instead of posting the same content across all the platforms, I'm doing English on Instagram, and then on Twitter, I'm now most mostly posting in Japanese, and I find that I've actually gotten a huge reaction just by switching the language of my posts, because if I post in English, people think that I'm not in Japan. But if I post in Japanese, now I'm getting these Japanese retweets. Um, uh, I think I racked up like 100 likes on, on one of them, uh, which is not that much in the grand scheme of things. But it, it's really interesting for me to see uh, how the different um, countries, uh, they, they're operating actually differently and, and they're having conversations differently on the various different um, social media platforms. And in fact, in fact, there will be people who are on Instagram, but they won't post on Instagram. They won't talk to you on Instagram. They will talk about you on Twitter in Japanese. <laughs> and um, and so, so there was one particular person like that who was asking about this um, triple stack King Eagle that I made for um, fantastic, you know, calligrapher Right Ocean. And... Uh, she said, "Oh, I, I saw these people using uh, using these modified fountain pens that make your words look like they're written with a brush, and I just can't get around my head how you do that." And then other Japanese people respond to that and, and tag me, and and then I join the conversation. But it's interesting that they wouldn't just ask on on Instagram; they kind of indirectly ask on Twitter because Twitter, you're kind of just tweeting out to the world, right? So it's more of a stream of consciousness. So I'm curious if you've seen like a, you know, what does your audience on on your different social media look like? <laughs> well, I mean, most of my audience is on Instagram, so I don't have too much to compare with. But um, what I've noticed so far from my very few experiments on, on TikTok and uh, and even on YouTube, that like, like general stationery, like glass pens, Hobonichi does a lot better than, than fountain pens. <laughs> Perhaps to no one's <laughs> surprise, because on Instagram, this 
you know i think we have managed to have get a bit of a like hardcore fountain pen following and so they appreciate mm-hmm. those kind of posts but if you if you don't really have all of have a following and you're at the mercy of the algorithm then it seems as if like general stationary stuff does a lot better yeah yeah i, I think it's interesting just how you know different groups of audiences kind of reach out in different ways and it reminds me that there's so much more uh peop- there are so many more people out there that could be interested in this stuff um but that haven't joined the conversation in, in one way or another or for some reason or another so so i think it is quite a positive uh positive thing for for our little corner of the world yeah for sure yeah um last thing uh japan is uh, almost finally open yeah i heard was it october 11th is is that yeah. is that finalized now when supposedly you should you will be able to travel to japan without any visas or or any special paperwork it's now business as usual um, if your passport allows visa-free entry into Japan, I, I believe that is, or or landing visa to Japan. Yeah, but, but that's, that's that no different from pre-pandemic. Generally. Yeah. Yeah. So pre-pandemic travel. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and because of this, a lot of people are very excited to come to Tips. Actually. Now there's a there's a small snag, because. Um, Pre-pandemic, you used to buy the tickets at the door, right? Do you remember when we were in Asakusa? Right, right, right. Yeah, and there was no limit on how many people can can go in to the venue at a time. But I remember we we lined up uh, first, kind of outside, and then they they summoned us into into the big hall, and they had us line up. There was like you know like hundreds of people in line to wait for for the start of the event but since 2020 since the pandemic we've shifted to an online purchase and this online purchase is run through uh run through yahoo japan so the same system as as yahoo auctions right and um there's there's a an issue that foreign credit cards uh aren't allowed to buy the, the tickets <laughs> ah, I see. Uh, of tips so, so ma- maybe so, they yeah. didn't anticipate that japan would lift these restrictions yeah. before they went okay and, and i i don't think they anticipated that yahoo wasn't gonna you know let foreign credit cards buy the tickets because presumably uh they moved to yahoo really so that they could move away from the paper tickets right and you know, foreign visitors were really concerned, but now I think they they really have to pivot because you can't be an international pen show, right? You can't be the Tokyo International Pen Show if you can't have international guests. Yeah, but but the things are, a lot of things are called international here that are not really international, so it's just a proud tradition here. But yeah, I, I agree that they probably were taken by surprise by the fact that Japan, yeah. after many like false starts, actually did open up <laughs> yeah so so that's quite interesting um for listeners out there i think there's a solution i think you just need to contact the organizers and they'll they'll sort it out for you yeah and um yeah I, i'm looking forward to that i believe our next episode we can maybe get the gang together to talk about you know what we look forward to at the pen show uh, as we've done in the past few years yeah sounds good to me all right. And uh, with that, it's been episode 67. Thank you, everybody, so much. Uh, rate, review, subscribe. Is that what all the podcasters say now? Rate, review, subscribe. <laughs> um, but yeah, do help us spread the word. Um, let people know about your favorite podcast. So <laughs> with that, uh, thank you all so, so much. We really appreciate you listening to the end. My name is CY. You can find me on my website at tokyostationpens.com, on uh, on Instagram and TikTok at Tokyo Station Pens, and on Twitter at Tokyo Station MNH. And my name is Jacob. I'm Fudofan on Instagram and on Twitter, YouTube, and TikTok. And I have a blog at fudofan.com. Wait, you're on YouTube? I'm on YouTube now. 
<laughs> All right. A discussion for the next sure. time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.